Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Bayless. I'm the Library Services Supervisor uh, for Civic and Social Information Services at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, where we are tuning in live for our hybrid program. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, our Allegheny County Law Library partners, and all of you tuning in today or watching the recording later. We are uh, dedicated to offering programs, services, and information resources to help you learn about civic life and the importance of the First Amendment. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody that is joining us virtually for coming. Uh, my name is Duncan Hardiman. I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA doing currently a year of service um, at Pennsylvania for Modern Courts. Pennsylvania for Modern Courts is a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to ensuring all Pennsylvanians can come to court with confidence that they will be heard by qualified, fair, and impartial judges. We advocate for judicial reforms and educate Pennsylvanians about our courts with workshops like these and other educational programs. We envision a Pennsylvania judicial system where all participants are ensured impartiality, fairness, accessibility, and respect. Our presenter today is Deborah Gross. She's the president and CEO of PMC. Prior to this, she has 35 years of private legal experience and was the 2017 chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association. She is currently a board member of numerous civic, legal, and educational organizations, including Drexel Law. And in the fall, she teaches complex litigation at Villanova Law. I'll hand it over to her. Okay, Duncan, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. As Duncan mentioned, this is our court basics program. And we are here at the Carnegie Law Library, which is a Carnegie Law, Carnegie Library. And we are doing this in conjunction with the Allegheny Law Library, but you will see shortly. If you have any problems with the feed or seeing us, you can email staff at pmconline.org. This will be available on our website at www.pmconline.org. And, um, and that website also has a lot of information. Go through it slowly, lots of programs, uh, information about uh, our benefit, about judicial independence. So please feel free to peruse. We are very appreciative of Comcast NBC Universal because they are the sponsors of our court basics programming. So thank you. And Duncan already explained who PMC is. But this is a little bit about the work that we do. We advocate on behalf of the courts, on behalf of access to the courts. We advocate for an independent judiciary. We also teach. We teach many different types of law programs to help pro se litigants or just to help you understand the court system, the three branches of government. We have a program for journalists to help educate them about the court system so that they can report fairly and accurately. So again, thank you to the Carnegie Law, Carnegie Library and Jessica Bayless. We have had a number of programs with the library and we very much appreciate it. And thank you to the Allegheny Law Library. County Law Library. We just had our benefit there last night. It was spectacular. And Lori Hagen, thank you very much. You are very welcome. May I just quickly say that I am one of the reference librarians here at the Allegheny County Law Library, as well as the community outreach librarian here. And on our slide, you have our address where we're located, our hours that we're open, phone number where you can call for assistance. You can send an email. Our website has a lot of resources right there for you to access. But if you need assistance with that, also just give us a call. We can give you legal research assistance, but not legal advice. We do have forms here that people can fill out if they have complaints that they need to file, motions, that kind of thing. That's what we have in our library and we can help you find those but we cannot help you find and fill them out, I'm sorry to say. So I Great. turn it back over to you. Thanks, Lori, very much. Thank you. Okay, so today we're gonna divide this program into three different areas. We're gonna explain the structure of our Pennsylvania court system. We're gonna discuss the election of judges, which is an odd number of years. So this year, while you should get out to vote, it is not for judges. And then we're gonna talk about your role within the court system. Okay, so our Pennsylvania court system. 
So our court is actually one of the oldest courts in the country. We were created before the, uh, our Pennsylvania constitution was actually created before the US constitution was created. I'm confused, sorry about that. Okay, what happened to my triangle? Aha, uh -huh. sorry. Okay, here's our court system. So Pennsylvania's court system it has a, you see this picture of a triangle all over the place. It's on the Pennsylvania court systems, for example, whose website is pacourts, dot us. It's important to know that the, the, uh, the reason for the triangle, entry level courts or the magisterial district courts, which are at the bottom, and most people in our Commonwealth access the magisterial district courts. As you go up this triangle and it narrows, which we will explain further, there is less, um, fewer cases that, are, that apply or get to the Supreme Court. So in Allegheny County, the magisterial district courts fall within the minor judiciary. In Allegheny County, there are 46 magisterial district courts. Um, Allegheny County is also known as the fifth judicial district of Pennsylvania. This little okay, and in magisterial district courts, how do you how do you file a case? Why would you use a magisterial district court for any type of matter where there is some kind of dispute under twelve thousand dollars for summary and minor offenses for landlord tenant disputes which are under twelve thousand dollars for criminal cases except for murder and voluntary manslaughter for non traffic summary offenses for traffic offenses. This is not a court of record, it, meaning that once there's a decision made by this court it, and, you, and you maybe decide you don't like it, you would appeal that decision. But the, it, when you appeal it, it's, it, you start anew, you start fresh. The other thing that's important here is that in magisterial district courts, there are no jury trials and there is no recording of any of the hearings unless you request it or even bring in your own uh, recorder. You cannot bring, you cannot record things on your camera, cannot take pictures that is illegal in Pennsylvania in the courtroom. After you go to the Allegheny um, Municipal Courts or the Magisterial District Courts, and for example, you've had a trial or you had a hearing and you have a decision and you're not happy with it, what do you do? Well, you then could appeal it to the Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas. This court hears Hears, also hears matters that are over $12,000. It does hold civil and criminal jury trials. It adjudicates matters involving children and families. And there are 43 common police court judges in the, 50, in the fifth judicial district. This is how the court administration is set up. The president judge is Kim Berkeley Clark. She is the first African-American president judge in Allegheny County. She just gave her a keynote address at yesterday's uh, PMC spring benefit. Uh, and under her, there are the, the common pleas court is divided into different divisions, as you see from this chart. So the, the civil division is headed by Judge Christy Mord. The criminal division is headed by Judge Jill Rangos. The family division is headed by Judge Kim Eaton. And orphans court division is headed by Judge Lawrence O'Toole. The names are of each division are what they, you know, what you think they are. Civil division, a civil case is a matter that's between two private individuals or an individual and a business. The criminal division is a matter which is between a the Commonwealth and an individual or the county and an individual. Family division is where you find, uh, where you would file for divorce, child support, juvenile matters. Uh, there's a protection from abuse for, in, and children, and there's a children's court. Orphan's court is a name that is, I would like to say, antiquic, antiquic, antiquic oh my God, antiquated, thank you. <laughs> and it addresses wills and estates, guardianship, adoptions. After our, as I remember the triangle, so we're getting narrower. After our court of common pleas, if for some reason, you are not happy with a decision from the Court of Common Pleas or a jury or a jury verdict, you could appeal the case. 
and you appeal your case to an intermediate appellate court. Our two intermediate appellate courts are our Superior Court and our Commonwealth Court. Our Commonwealth Court was founded in 1968. It is unique to Pennsylvania. There are no other states in our country that have a Commonwealth Court. It only hears government and government agency cases. So if the township or county had some kind of real estate matter against you, they would bring it before the Commonwealth Court. The pictures are of two recently elected judges to our Commonwealth Court um, because the, um, the Commonwealth Court picture is a little outdated, as you will see. One of our, I'm attached here, but one of our judges from uh, who's sitting in the picture of Commonwealth Court actually was elected to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. But we have Judge Lori Dumas and Judge Stacy Wallace who were elected to the Commonwealth Court recently. Our Pennsylvania Superior Court, which we mentioned before, is, is typically the court to which a matter from um, Court of Common Pleas, which you aren't happy you would appeal to. Our Pennsylvania Superior Court is one of the busiest courts in the country because there is an automatic right of appeal. It was founded in 1895. It hears civil and criminal cases. And um, the woman on the right, Judge Megan King, was recently elected to our Superior Court. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court is the highest court in Pennsylvania. It has the ultimate authority on matters brought before the lower courts. Its review is discretionary. That means that it doesn't have to take every appeal. It makes a decision as to whether it's going to take an appeal or not. And typically, it will only take appeal on a matter that it thinks is, you know, is presidential, meaning it's important and really will have repercussions for every citizen in the in, across the state. There is one unique way to go directly to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and that's through the King's Bench Power. It's called the Power of Extraordinary Jurisdiction, and it, they sometimes decide to take a case and sometimes they don't. There has been recent situations such as election law matters where the court has exercised its King's Bench Power. These are the justices of our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Justice Brobson on, in the small square is the most recent justice to be elected to our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Previously, Justice Saylor, the individual in the middle with the white hair, was our president judge or chief judge. It is now Justice M Max Fair, who is uh, seated with the curly hair as our chief judge in our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Our Pennsylvania Supreme Court does more than decide cases. It has a, it has a a wide range of powers, I'll say. It has an administrative office of the Pennsylvania courts where it is responsible for educating judges for budgeting of the court system. It appoints numerous committees which help establish civil rules, procedural uh, criminal rules, ev rules of evidence, rules for the minor courts. It has a judicial conduct board that regulates the conduct of judges. It also regulates the practice of law, including attorney admission and discipline. This is the city county building at Grant Street and Forbes Avenue, which is home to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Pennsylvania Superior Court, and Commonwealth Courts uh, when hearing cases. The city county building is also the building where we had our benefit in uh, last night. It's a beautiful old historic building. So Pennsylvania, I would like to say, is pretty unique. I, I don't, it's not, um, it's one of the few court, I guess, few states in the country where it has such a large percentage of women on the bench. In, um, in of, across all of Pennsylvania and all the judges, over 30% are active judges. 33% of our common police court judges are women, 26% of our magisterial district court judges are women, and in Philadelphia, 28% of the municipal court judges are women. If you recall back to the slide where we discussed Allegheny County, the majority of the um, administrative, you know, president judges of each of, of the Allegheny County are women. So we are 
I'm, we're not unique, but we are rare, I would like to say. So we just discussed the Pennsylvania system, but there's also the federal system, which most people are more familiar with, right? We, we've heard a lot in the news recently about the U.S. Supreme Court. The, um, so the federal courts, it's known as a federal court system. It addresses matters involving federal laws, federal statutes, the U.S. Constitution. It also addresses matters where there are disputes between uh, a plaintiff and a defendant that are greater than $75,000. So typically where you would file an, a case in federal court is in U.S. district court, depends on what state you're in. Uh, if you even are in Pennsylvania, if you live in Pittsburgh, you'd file it, you would file a matter in the Western district of Pennsylvania. If you were in Harrisburg, you'd file a matter in the, in the middle district of Pennsylvania. And if you were in Philadelphia, you'd file a matter in the Eastern district of Pennsylvania. That court would have, can have criminal and civil jury trials. A decision could be rendered and appealed. And in Pennsylvania, it would be appealed to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. If the Third Circuit Court of Appeals rendered a decision from which you are not happy, for example, you could appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Again, the U.S. Supreme Court has the option to decide not to take your case. As I briefly mentioned, that Pennsylvania is divided into three districts, the Western, Middle, and Eastern District, and the Third Circuit, which is the appellate court level, covers Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and the Virgin Islands. The federal courthouse here in Allegheny County is at Grand 7th Street. Are there any questions about the federal and state court system? Okay, let's move on. So this, the second area is the election of judges in Pennsylvania in odd numbered years. So we discussed briefly the differences between the state and the federal system. But most importantly, the federal system judges are appointed based on a merit selection. So as we know, they are appointed for life. We do not elect them. But in Pennsylvania, we elect our judges in odd numbered years. I would venture to say that many of you don't recall the last judge you've elected. But in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court judge justices are elected for 10 year terms. The intermediate appellate courts judges are elected for 10 year terms and so are the Court of Common Pleas judges. They are elected for an initial 10 year term after which they serve and then they are re-elected but a retention by a retention vote. So that means that you as the voter get to decide yay or nay as to whether they should uh, continue as a judge. With respect to the entry-level court judges, remember the magisterial district courts, they are elected every six years. And there is no such thing as a retention election for a magisterial district court judge. These are the requirements to be a magisterial district court judge. They have to be 21 years old, a resident of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a resident of the magisterial district for one year, and they have to be certified by the Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts as completing a program administered by the Minor Judiciary Education Board. Notice there's no requirement that you complete any kind of uh, high school, college, or even law school. Um, but there is a requirement that you do as a magisterial district judge complete a, an educational program, which is about a one month rigorous training program uh, administered by the Minor Judiciary Education Board. If you are an attorney, you are still entitled to run for magisterial district or judge, but you don't have to complete that initial practicum course. What you will have to do is complete a yearly education course. And every judge in Pennsylvania has a yearly um, continuing education course that they must complete or courses. Who becomes a judge or justice? So these are the, com the common pleas court judges, the intermediate appellate court judges, and our Supreme Court, oh, our Supreme Court judge. So you have to be a lawyer. You have to pass the Pennsylvania bar. You have to be a res district resident for one year. 
And as we discussed, you're, you're electing these judges, so therefore they are, and we are in electing them in partisan elections. So therefore also you are electing them in the primaries as well as general elections. As I mentioned before, federal judges again are appointed by the president for life. There is a nominating committee that, is ma that makes suggestions to senators who then make a suggestion to the president. There is a very thorough FBI and Justice Department investigation. And then a Senate confirmation hearing, which some of us have even had the good fortune to watch on TV. These are the differences between the Pennsylvania court system, again, a summary, and the United States court, federal court system. Oh, there's a, do I? So again, can, can you name anyone for whom you voted? Think about it. When you went to the polls, do you, did you even know the individual whose name was up there? Any questions? Okay, so this is very important. This is your role within the Allegheny County Courts. There, we need you to become an active citizen in our democracy. Democracy works when our citizens participate. So first, one way you could participate is through your service as a juror. You'll get a summons in the mail that says, it could be from federal court, it could be from a state court that says, we need you to sit as a juror for a jury trial. The jury trial would be a, in a criminal matter or it could be in a civil matter. You might also get a summons for to sit on a grand jury. Now that is different, okay? Civil and criminal cases, you have a judge, you have each side represented by counsel typically, and, you know, it could be a half a day trial. It could be a, a couple week trial. A indicting grand jury is a matter that could last for a few weeks. They could meet maybe the first Wednesday of every month for 12 months. It hears testimony from people who are summoned to appear before it. It is, there's only one side the prosecutor is presenting the case to the jury to determine if there is enough evidence against this individual to file a case in criminal court. Um, jury duty, you know, you can, if, if there are ways of being excused from jury duty, I don't encourage it. Um, they used to excuse lawyers from sitting on jury duty because they would say that you are, you know, you, you're too familiar with the legal system. You could, you could control the jury. I sat as a juror once. I, it was a, it was a great learning experience for me. I did not choose to lead the jurors. I wanted them to come up with a decision and I chose to try to be quiet. Of course, that's very hard for me, but, um, but it was a, it is a fascinating experience and I would highly recommend it. But if you, you know, there, there's a, what's known as a voir dire. So sometimes it's a judge, sometimes it's the lawyers who will ask uh, potential jurors questions which may conflict you out. We talked, this is another way. So that's the first method of you to participate in our democracy is, is sitting as a juror. Another way for you to participate in our democracy is by judicial elections in Pennsylvania. But you shouldn't just go into the ballot box and decide, oh, I know that name, because you may not know that name, it could be a familiar name, or I like the sound of that name, or I, I like that the person is a female. You know, we you really need to do homework as to each candidate running. So how do you do that homework? Well, what, and what, how do you make a decision? You should make a decision as to whether a candidate would be a good judge based on their legal experience. You know, you could, the internet is a wonderful thing. You can Google that person and, and maybe see a case or, you know, hear about a case or read a brief that that person has written. That you should consider that person's reputation for integrity and fairness, for community involvement in public service. You know, it's really important that, that those who are running for office 
give back to their community. Um, you know, on get their, the individual's ongoing educational and professional activities, their commitment to equal justice. In addition, the area bar associations evaluate candidates. Candidates go before the bar associations, they answer a questionnaire, there is a committee that typically does, I'll say, investigation. They interview about 20 individuals to, that are not recommended by the candidate to get references. They ask judges uh, for references uh, from, you know, there are judges before whom the candidates have, have been um, argued or had trials. That, so you can go onto the Pennsylvania Bar Association website, the Allegheny County Bar Association website, and, and find out about these candidates. Additionally, the League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh publishes information on candidates. They submit um, a, uh, questionnaires to the candidates and ask them to fill out. The other place that you could do, go to is the Disciplinary Board of Pennsylvania or the Pennsylvania Judicial Conduct Board because you will find out whether that attorney has ever been disciplined before, whether that judge has ever been disciplined before. I know I'm running out of time here. So, you know, it's important for you to vote. Again, judicial decisions affect all of us. It, you know, you should not be sitting back and saying, oh, my vote doesn't count. Um, in an odd number of years, PMC holds candidate forums for appellate court candidates. We welcome questions from, from you as viewers. So please, you know, look and into the various ways for, to participate in our democracy. I think we are almost out of time. Oh, to, oh, 1.30. Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I'm looking at the clock and it's one o'clock. Okay, so we are totally fine. I shouldn't be rushing. So this is an important pro process. You know, the judiciary is a third branch of government, government, right? We have the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judiciary. And this is how we've been operating in America for, you know, almost like 300 years, right? So why is it so important? They each balance each other out. They're each responsible for various uh, duties and responsibilities. The, you know, the legislature enacts laws. The judiciary looks at the laws, considers the laws, sees if people comply with the laws. Do the laws um, are the laws unconstitutional? J judges make decisions as to whether a law that's passed by the legislature is unconstitutional. Sometimes uh, the the court can make a decision that a law is unconstitutional, and the legislature will then revise the law. So there's a there's a I'd like to say a give and take, a balancing process, a checks and balance between the three branches of government. Recently, there has been an attack on the independence of the judiciary. You know, we we are very fortunate in our country that that we have an independent judiciary that they that they can make decisions based on the rule of law, based on the Constitution. But there are a number of uh, proposed amendments to Pennsylvania's Constitution, which do threaten the judiciary's um, independence. One is House Bill 38, which has to do with appellate court redistricting. What that means is it is a proposed constitutional amendment to change the way we elect our appellate court judges. So right now, everyone elects all of our appellate court judges when there are positions open or when it's for retention election. Uh, appellate court judges make decisions that impact everybody across the Commonwealth. They are not uh, you know, judges that are just for Allegheny County, for Philadelphia County, but, but they make decisions that impact everybody across the state. There is a proposed um, constitutional amendment that would change that. And for the Supreme Court, for example, the, the state would be divided into seven jurisdictions, and each jurisdiction would be responsible for electing one Supreme Court judge. The Superior Court, Pennsylvania, would be divided into 15 jurisdictions, and each jurisdiction would be responsible for electing one superior court judge. And again, the Commonwealth Court would be divided into various districts and each jurisdiction or district would be responsible for one Commonwealth Court judge. This is problematic. It is they're then making the, the, uh, the judge, um, I would like to say, con more concerned with the constituency 
than with uh, with the rule of law. That proposed constitutional amendment has been passed once by our, so how does a constitutional amendment actually um, happen or go through? So the proposed constitutional amendment has been passed once and approved once fully by the House and Senate has been published. And if it's approved a second time, it will be put as a referendum on the ballot. What is interesting for proposed constitutional amendments is that the governor does not have a right to veto them. There's another proposed constitutional amendment that would uh, have term limits on appellate court judges. Right now, our appellate court judges don't have term limits, but they do have age limits. I don't know if you recall this, but a while back, there was a referendum on the ballot that increased the age limits for judges. We used to have age limits of 70 years old for our appellate court judges, and they are now have now been extended to 75. What that means is that when a judge hits 75, they have to take senior status. So again, most recently, Justice Saylor hit age 75, and he took senior status, and that is why there was an opening on our sp Supreme Court. Um, this year, Justice Baer will turn 75, so there will be an opening for his position in the 2023 election calendar. There's also another proposal uh, to amend our constitution to have no retention elections. So right now we had discussed retention elections. So after a judge sits for 10 years, you know, has, been re has been elected and has a 10 year seat, that judge can run for re-election, but the re-election is for retention. So it's a yes or no vote should this judge be reelected. There is not even a party listed on the ballot as to which, um, as to whether this judge belongs to a party. That's great. This means that this judge is truly independent. You are not electing this judge based on their party affiliation, but you are electing this judge based on their. Um, um, on their responsibilities, on how well they've performed. And you can find out again about how well they've performed by doing you know, research on the internet. But here they're proposing to get rid of retention elections. This also has implications on who decides who may want to run for election. You know, does somebody want to run for uh, a 10 year term knowing that Again, they'll have to run, you know, almost from from scratch, right? For their second term, they'll they could potentially have a contested primary election, which would not happen if there was if uh, if the retention elections would continue. And judges ha abide by a, a code of conduct, and they are not allowed to run or to to have campaign committees and and raise raise funds until one year prior to uh, their re-elections. So they would be limited in their, and how they could campaign if they were running in a contested retention election. Um, it's just, you know, it, 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 it exacerbates the problem with election, with electing judges. There is, there is more money that has to be raised. And, you know, we want our judges to be independent of money, independent of politics, and focus on making decisions based on the rule of law. The last proposed, most recent, I will say, proposed constitutional amendment um, is this House Bill 1990. It is a proposal to change how the authority, to change really the authority of the Supreme Court. It's to change the balance of powers. Remember, I discussed that there was in three, three powers, the three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Right now, the judiciary branch has a lot of administrative authority. It, it oversees its own rules, you know, uh, civil procedural, criminal procedural, evidentiary rules, practices, and administration. It, overse it oversees the practice of law by lawyers. There is a proposal to change this, to, to hand this back, to hand this to the legislature. It is interesting, you know, is the legislature comprised of majority of lawyers who know what the practice of law is, who know what judges do? No, not anymore. And should the legislature have oversight over attorneys being admitted into the practice of law? So there are a number of bills that are um, 
I would like to say threatening the independence of the judiciary, the one that we right now have to have our, uh, our focus on is House Bill 38. But as of now, we don't, it is not, it is not um, heading anywhere, but stay tuned. And you can find out more about it on pmconline.org. Okay. The other thing that we wanted to just discuss is pro se representation or self representation. Oftentimes, um, it you know you don't know where to go to hire an attorney. So first, you could go to a bar association. The Allegheny County Bar Association has a lawyer referral service. If you can't afford a lawyer, the Allegheny County Bar Association or the Allegheny County Bar Foundation will assist you. But should you choose to um, represent yourself, you would go, you would have to, you need to learn a little bit of information as to how you file a case, where you file a case, what type of case you're filing, what documents you need. But all civil cases begin with the filing of a complaint. If again, if it's under $12,000, you would be filing a complaint with the magisterial district court, and that would be a court that's located in your district. So, um, you know, Bethel, uh, Bethel Park has, has its own MDJ, um, uh, you know, Mount Lebanon has its own MDJ, but you, you'd actually need to go onto the website to figure out where, what court is closest to you if that's where the matter in issue, I'll say, is. Uh, if it's a matter that's greater than $12,000, you would be filing it with the Allegheny Court of Common Pleas. You can go to the courthouse now. Courts are fully open. The clerk's office could assist you with the filing. There's also a lot of information available online. The 5th Judicial District has its own website, which I don't see up here, but we will, we will be really happy to share with you, um, as well as the pacourts.us. There are forms available, and there, there are people who could help you uh, help you complete the forms. They are not allowed to fill out the forms for you, but they are more than happy to answer questions. Like even there's a lot of legal jargon, I would say, even who is the plaintiff and who is the defendant. The plaintiff, plaintiff means that you are bringing the case. Defendant is the person that you are bringing a case against. 